On this episode of Real Truth, we're going to start out with the praiseworthy or cringeworthy. This will include topics like theft, God's word, a cutting edge ministry, magic, and even spit. Yeah, you heard that right. Then we have a real take in response from the ongoing controversy over transgender athletes competing in women's sports. How does the Bible address this issue? Let's consider the truth of all of that up next. great show ready for you today as we consider many of the negative and positive things that happen in our culture. Let's consider a biblical response to the positive and the negative with this edition of Praiseworthy or Cringeworthy. Our first item involves Michael Todd, pastor of Transformation Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, he recently wiped his spit on a man's face as a sermon illustration this past Sunday. As you probably guessed, I'm going to call this cringeworthy. To illustrate Jesus' healing of the blind man, the pastor spit into his hand and wiped it onto the face of a man he has to stand by him on stage. His point was that receiving vision from God might get nasty. In the video of the moment, you could hear the audience gasping in response to which he said this. What I'm telling you is how you just reacted. It's how the people in your life will react when God is doing what it takes for the miracle. Todd has since apologized and acknowledged that this was too extreme. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, the man was his brother, but he understood that this was a distraction to his preaching because, well, it was disgusting. He faced a lot of criticism on Twitter on Monday, mainly because of the concerns that many have over germs even though Jesus did make blood out of his spit to heal the blind man, that does not make this an appropriate illustration. Spit is not considered sanitary, and even the Bible describes situations when encountering spit would make one unclean. Some might say that this makes Jesus' actions inappropriate, but I do think Jesus would have had the ability to ensure that his spirit was clean. I guess you could say that he had holy spirit. Okay, and not a good joke, but you get the point. Really, the point of his healing was to show the compassion of Jesus and that he was the Son of God. This illustration was inappropriate because it distracted from this point. Since everyone is so concerned with cleanliness because of the pandemic, this becomes a stumbling block. Look at 2 Corinthians 6 verse 3. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. You see, in making this illustration, it becomes an obstacle to Michael Todd's ministry and to the gospel. His actions invited criticism and gave people a negative perception of his ministry and even the gospel. I am grateful that he apologized. I just hope he is more careful in the way he handles the gospel from now on. Our next item involves former Virginia elementary teacher, Anna Salisbury. CBN reports that she started having prayer walks around the public school where she worked. During one of these prayer walks, she had the idea to distribute Bibles to school libraries. As a result, she founded the nonprofit organization Bibles in Schools 
in 2019, and now she does this full time. This is a praiseworthy effort. CBN News says that her organization has provided Bibles to more than 1,500 school libraries in 43 states. In addition, Bibles in Schools has also reached six countries outside the U.S. School libraries have even written her to request more Bibles because they are so frequently checked out. It is such an important ministry to get Bibles into our schools so children have easy access to God's Word. It is the Bible that God uses to reveal sin and to bring salvation to the lost. Just look at Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Getting the Bible out there is so important because it is the power of salvation. It is the power to salvation that God provides to save people. And look at Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. People have to hear in order to believe the word of God. In order to have faith, you have to hear the message. That's why it's so important that this ministry that she is doing by giving Bibles in schools. Good for her. Now I want to tell you about Jim Hines, a pastor at Summit Church in Florida. The Christian Post says that he was recently fired after he stole $1,000 from their Christmas Eve offering. He was previously accused of a similar theft in 2018, but that could never be proven. Now he admits that he stole money on both occasions. There is no mistaking the fact that this is cringeworthy. There has been a growing trend of crime in the church and financial fraud is expected to reach $80 billion by 2025. It is sinful for any Christian to be involved in a crime, and this is even in the church. In this case, it was particularly egregious because it is done by a pastor of the church. The Bible holds pastors to an even greater standard, and there is absolutely no excuse for this kind of behavior in the church. It is clear from the Ten Commandments that stealing is a sin. The Bible also tells us that God wants us to be good stewards and that pastors should not be greedy. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2 says, Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Now, this is kind of particularly speaking of leaders in the church, but I think it could apply to everyone that God wants us to be wise with our money. It obviously is a, is a sin to steal. And we should be good stewards of what God has given us to use. And that is especially true for leaders in the church. Another relevant verse is Titus 1 verse 7. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant, or quick-tempered, or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain. The Bible says that he must be above reproach. And unfortunately, in this situation, this pastor was not. He shouldn't be greedy for gain. Instead, he should be a good steward with what, is, what God has entrusted him to use, especially in that leadership position in the church. Next is a story from a religious news service. Alex Naranjo and Marlene Vargas, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, are the founders of the House of Intuition and authors of the book, Your Intuition That You Hear. They teach that magic is the natural birthright to humans that we all have access to. 
You don't have to be taught by witches or the, be the descendant of a magician to get into touch with that magic. This is another clear winner for the cringeworthy killer court. Both of these women were brought up as Catholics and later got involved in magic. They learned various rituals and put magic into practice through their intentions and intuition. Now they offer rituals for people to try and sell candles, crystals, and oils to help people get involved in magic based on inspiration from anything or established traditions. In this way, people can use magic to find success and peace. The article tells us that to this day, Urenjo and Vargas still incorporate some Catholic prayers into their magic rituals. It's not a one or the other type of situation. There is no set God in magic, the authors write. Urenjo and Vargas basically mix magic with religion. While there is no set God in magic, there is only one true God. God's Word clearly teaches that there is only one way to receive salvation and spiritual success. God does not promise material success in this life, but He does give eternal life and success to those who believe in Him. Anything that we worship in His place is an idol that steals attention away from the one who deserves all honor and all glory. Magic is an idol that is condemned in Scripture, and the Bible clearly teaches that God does not give His glory to another. In Deuteronomy 18 verses 10 through 11, the Bible says, There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination, or tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. See, that clearly condemns these types of practices. All of those things I just listed in that verse basically define what we today call magic, and they shouldn't be practiced by anyone, and they should certainly be condemned by the church. This is further stated in Colossians 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Unfortunately, these women are taken captive by this magic. I hope and pray that they one day see the truth of the gospel and believe in Christ for salvation. Our last story in this segment comes from Christian Headlines. Ed is about the Christian ministry, Groundwire, that seeks to use social media to reach millennials and Generation Z youth for Christ. In 2021, because of their efforts, over 190,000 young people gave their lives to Christ. This is praiseworthy. This organization uses social media to reach these youth since they spend a lot of time online. They generate interest through short videos and connect their viewers with mentors and websites that share their gospel to them. This has been very successful for the organization, and the founder, Seth Dunn, is humbled by their success. He is thankful that God uses his ministry, and he knows that their success isn't because of them, it is because of Christ. God wants believers to be his witnesses and ambassadors for the gospel. It is great to see that this organization is having success at being God's witnesses. This should encourage us all to be more involved in sharing the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, 
Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled. You see, their plot clearly shows that we are called to be God's ambassadors and to call them to be reconciled to God. Now, that certainly falls more heavily on those who are evangelists and called to be pastors. But I do think that it applies to all of us when it says that we should be ambassadors for Christ and be witnesses of the gospel. All right. 1615 tells us that and he said to them go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation this was jesus's command to the apostles to go and share the gospel now that he had risen from the dead and was about to leave them and i think that falls to us as well it might look different for different people but there are all ways that God wants us to be involved with being his witnesses throughout the world. So congratulations to this ministry for all the great work that they are accomplishing. Now it is time for Real Take, the segment where I share a biblical take on cultural opinions, events, or news. There is an outcry from women athletes and their parents over NCAA rules that allow transgender athletes to compete against biological women. The debate over this issue blew up in December when Leah Thomas, a transgender athlete who used to swim on the men's team, began breaking multiple records in women's meets. Christian Headlines reports that Thomas won the 1,650 by more than 38 seconds, and the 2,003 by more than 7 seconds. Thomas's times in the 200 and 500 were the best in the country this season. Forbes.com reports that according to Donna Lopiano, president of Sports Management Resources and an adjunct professor, a sports management at Southern Connecticut State University, Thomas is swimming extraordinarily fast women's times that are of course for breaking collegiate national records set by the likes of Katie Ledecky in the 500-yard freestyle and Missy Franklin in the 200-yard freestyle. The NCAA does require that male to female athletes receive testosterone suppression treatment, but does not define a target for testosterone levels. This is an issue because the testosterone level for women is 0.06 to 1.68 nano moles per liter, while the range for males is 7.7 7 to 29.4 nano moles per liter. Two-time Olympic medalist Erica Brown who is also a Christian, doesn't want to create hate. But to speak up for what is right, she recently said in an Instagram story, we cannot allow transgender females to compete against biological women. A biological male goes through male puberty. Even when she has transitioned, she still has the physiology of a male. A few years of testosterone blockers and estrogen doesn't change the fact that you have more powerful muscles, a larger heart, and greater lung capacity than a biological woman. According to a recent Christian Headlines article, a paper by researchers from Marquette University, Duke University, and the Mayo Clinic supports Brown's argument. The paper found about a 5% difference across the board between Thomas's best times as a female compared to Thomas's best times competing as a male. By comparison, biological men competing in elite competitions are about 10 to 15 percent faster than biological women in short events and 7 to 10 percent faster in long distance events. The paper found 
the science makes it clear that even after testosterone suppression, physiological males that compete as women have an unfair advantage. This is such a large issue that even Michael Phelps, one of the winningest American Olympic swimmers, recently spoke up against this. Many people fighting against this don't even disagree with transgenderism. They just think that their physiology gives them an unfair advantage. Many people are calling for a change from NCAA to bring fairness back to women's sports. This is such a complicated issue, even from a secular perspective. So what is the real take? I said this before, but I'll say it again. I don't hate transgenders, and it is my intention to show them the love of Jesus even though their lifestyle is sinful and inconsistent with scripture. I hope to lovingly confront all varieties of sinners so they can hear the truth and believe in Christ. The world labels this perspective as hate. But I don't see how it is hateful to warn unbelievers that if they continue in sin, it will only bring eternal destruction in hell. I would hope that everyone would turn to Christ and avoid this horrible fate. Just to be clear, this is not my perspective. This is simply what God's Word teaches. Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 is very applicable to this topic. It says, A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. This clearly shows that God dislikes this type of activity of trying to become the opposite sex. It just goes against scripture. And Genesis 1.27 shows how God created us. It says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You see, God creating male and female. God made us the gender he intended us to be. And any desire to change that or act on a rebellion to his institution of marriage is a sin. That doesn't mean God wants us to hate these people. It just means that they need to repent or they will face punishment. Psalm 106 verse 3 says, Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Is competing in this way justice? Look at Levit Leviticus 19.15. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Really what this is, is a form of injustice and impartiality. Transgender athletes are not competing fairly because they have an unfair advantage. They are deferring to the strengths of the real body that God gave them. Is that a righteous way to compete? Look also at Proverbs 12 verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. And look at Luke 6 31. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Transgender athletes are also competing deceptively and trying to get away with cheating by changing the look of their bodies. Even though you can change your appearance and undergo hormone therapy, that doesn't change many of the physiological factors that give men an advantage over women athletes. They are not living faithfully to the life that God gave them and I doubt they would want to compete against others who would have an unfair advantage against them. 
This is not living according to the golden rule or what scripture teaches. They have denied how God created them to be, and in this case, they're cheating because of it. As Christians, we do need to preach transgenderism with Christ. However, the Bible also tells us to speak the truth in love. The Bible clearly tells us how to handle these issues and what God really thinks about these things. Even though we must love everyone for the sake of the gospel, that does not erase the truth of scripture in regard to sin and one's eternal destiny. If you are watching this and you happen to be transgender, please know that God lovingly offers forgiveness and salvation if you would repent from your sins and believe in Jesus. I hope that this is a helpful and encouraging video to help you know how to respond to cultural issues as Christians. It can be difficult to live out the truth in a world that hates us, but we must be faithful and diligent to obey Christ and to share the truth of God's word. And we can do this in a way that is also sensitive towards people on these issues as long as we don't depart from the truth. If you like this video, it would really help if you hit that like button, turn on notifications, and subscribe to this channel. If you know someone who needs to hear this video, share it with them. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's it for this episode, and until next time, walk in the truth.